This is what it looks like when housing policy fails. Right. Oh, my. oh my God, yeah. that is terrible. It's almost impossible to put it into words that a human being in America goes to bed in a bed like that every night. Tenants living in squalor and danger. It smells of gas, it's not gas. With eviction, an ever-present threat. Right now, I'm not in a position to move in 10 days. We've handed control to the private market, and many tenants feel trapped. I'm stuck between choosing whether or not to be shot at or paying more. And I said, the TV, though, it's a TV still in it. My husband and I aren't heartless. We don't want to put kids out on the street, but it's also not my responsibility. I've got yeah. bills. Well, I'm the landlord. In this film, we ask why we still don't have decent, affordable housing for all. That was a solution to any problem you had running. You just move. And uh, why should we have to? Is it time for America to accept that it has an eviction epidemic? But as you can see, we're getting ready to move. As you can see with the seal on it, a real eviction notice. An epidemic that might only get worse. I don't want to leave. I have no place else to go. I will not have the funds to run the programs that are so desperately needed. We are heading to Jackson County Courthouse. That's in downtown Kansas City. We're going to see dozens and dozens of tenants on those dockets facing eviction this morning. As an attorney, Gina Chiala has decided to fight for the most vulnerable in society. Housing is one of the things that defines the character of your city. Is housing affordable, safe, sanitary? These questions are answered every Thursday on the seventh floor of the Jackson County Courthouse. Here, eviction cases are heard. These are two more courtrooms here where additional people are going to be facing eviction this morning. So four dockets altogether. For Gina and her team, it's frantic work trying to help tenants avoid eviction. I'm here in court right now for my landlord. He served me papers. And they're going to evict me, or at least they're threatening to evict me. My car broke down, and I needed a car to get to work. So I went and got a car payment. and was late on my rent. Landlords have to be paid rent, but tenants have rights too. I'm here today to fight for my rights. There's mold in the home. We're living in black mold. That's wrong. That's wrong. But in the experience of Gina and her team, many tenants are tripped up by the system. They don't know the information about the court process. They don't know what to file. They don't know when to file it. Gina comes across a tenant sitting distraught. So she came to court dutifully, came to court early. And as happens sometimes, because court is confusing, she sat in the wrong courtroom. While her case was heard in a different courtroom. When she realized her mistake, she dashed over and caught the landlord outside but he doesn't want to speak with her. And the court informed her that after 10 days, the sheriff would come in and remove her and her three children from her home. I don't know. I'm hoping that I can stop that judgment and obtain a lawyer so I can get more time to move. Leandra was behind on the rent but she wanted to tell the court that the landlord had ignored her complaints about the mold in the property. And my kids keep getting sick. How many were to move to there? At the moment, no. Gina offers what help she can, but Leandra doesn't stay in touch. Our housing laws in Missouri are skewed in favor of landlords, and tenants are definitely disfavored in the system. The Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom opened its doors in April of 2017. With a full-time staff of two, its mission is to help low-wage workers. They've only just started to attend the eviction court. We don't have funding for handling this docket, but when you see people getting evicted right there in front of you, and you know how to stop it, it's very difficult not to get involved. In October of 2017, this house in Kansas City's east side was rented by Tammy Austin. Three months later, and she's facing eviction. This is my first notice that I got on my door. And then comes a few weeks later, I got, as you can see with the seal on it, a real eviction notice. Having not long finished unpacking, she's now packing to move out. Where are you going to go to next time? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, because, you know, this is just happening. They don't give you a lot of time to find a place like that. Tammy no longer wants to stay, 
but she's anxious to avoid an eviction on a record because it makes it harder to rent. Gina takes on her case, but time is against them. There's a, a law on our books here in Missouri that says the judge has to set the case at the first possible court date. So Tammy is served with this lawsuit on December 27th, and then her first court date is January 4th, and her trial date is January 11th. It's not enough time to be able to adequately prepare a case for trial. Their case is that Tammy wasn't, in fact, late on a rent. I don't know how it's going to go, but hopefully everything goes in my favor. They head into court. The presiding judge declined our request to film inside. A short time later, and they're back out. The landlord didn't have an attorney, which is unusual. He took a position in court that was favorable to us and allowed us to potentially have won the case. It's a blessing to have had her here today with me because I don't know what the outcome would have been if she had not been here. It just makes me think about how many tenants would be able to avoid judgments in their cases if they had access to counsel. Is Gina onto something? Well, the Kansas City Eviction Project, headed by Tara Raghavir, has just finished crunching 10 years' worth of data for the Jackson County Eviction Court. From the data set, we know that around 9,000 evictions are filed every year in Jackson County. Many more are happening informally with no data to represent them. In 84% of cases, the landlord had an attorney, whereas the figure for tenants was just 1.3%. And in nearly every court case, the tenant was evicted is not just a forced move. It results in loss of jobs, loss of access to schools, to their health care providers. In recent years, New York City has dramatically expanded its free legal services for those facing eviction. Evictions dropped by 24 percent. Our hope is that we will be able to come up with a proposal, get it funded, and have an attorney who's just here full time. Right now, we're just doing it on the fly. 1987 was uh, when I bought my first rental property. Stephen Summers owns around 50 rental properties across Kansas City. We are off to knock on the door of one of our tenants that we are getting ready to file an eviction on. We try to educate our tenants. If the rent is late, there are late fees that have to be paid. If they're going to be late, to call me, to let me know. Because if I don't hear from them, I don't know what's going on. This tenant in northeast Kansas City owes Stephen around $3,000, which includes three months' rent. Stephen thought they'd agree to a payment schedule, but nothing is being paid so far, and he can't reach her by phone. If there's no penalty for not paying, it's just human nature. Why would you pay? Yeah, well, I'm the landlord. But I just can't buy. An eviction can cost Stephen. An empty house is a money hole. It will suck the money right out of my bank account. We don't want empty houses. Mom needs to give me a call uh, right away. Stephen cancels the eviction for this tenant after she starts to follow the payment schedule. But on a later date, two miles to the south, following a court order, there's a different outcome. We have to set the personal items out on the street curb as we are uh, changing the locks and they won't be allowed back on the property. The tenants aren't here. Stephen thinks they're at work and the kids at school. Some of the bigger furniture and some of the electronics are going to stay in the house. The tenant wants them, they can call me at the office. The monthly rent was $500 and they haven't paid the last four months. Stephen's team bag up all the personal items and it's left on the curb. Some people watching this may think, Steve's a bit heartless, isn't he? I mean, this is someone's home. Uh, I would say we followed the law. They had their chance to come and pay their rent. They refused to. Unfortunately, they're paying the price today. Stephen tries to avoid evictions like this by only renting to certain people. It's been our experience over the last 30 years that if someone is paying more than 25% of their income for their rent, they will not be able to keep that up. If you're paying over 30% of your income on housing, the federal government says you're cost burdened. So how many tenants are cost burdened in the Kansas City area? around 275,000. So I've always tried to keep rent within, I think the guideline is no more than 25 to 30% of your income. Amy works as a doctor at a hospital in Kansas City. I wanted to live in the crossroads because it is a great commute, but also I like the environment. I like the, the energy. The Renaissance Crossroads District 
lies to the south of downtown Kansas City. Amy first moved into a one bedroom here in 2011. And the rent was $1,000 a month and did not include utilities, but still seemed fair to me. Three years later, and Amy's landlord wanted to sell, so she had to move out. And so I found another place in the crossroads, one bedroom, one bathroom. It was $1,450 a month, so it was quite a jump up from what I had been paying. But with parking costs and a further rent increase, Amy found she was paying over 30% of her income on housing, so she had to leave. I realized that I couldn't afford to live in the crossroads. So I went south and I am paying significantly less than what I was paying before. So parts of Kansas City may have become too pricey even for doctors, but for those on a low income, it's the same all over. First, I am a housing economist. Secondly, I'm also a specialist on affordable housing programs sponsored by the federal government. The research of Professor Kirk McClure shows why. What this indicates is that if your income is below about $20,000 a year, there really just are not enough units for you in the Kansas City area. The orange bars show the number of households in each income bracket in the Kansas City metro area. The blue bars show the availability of affordable rental units. You'll see there's a shortage of units for the poorer households. As rents increase faster than inflation, renter income increases slower than inflation, we are not adding units at the lower end of the price spectrum. We're creating that perfect storm for evictions. In the Kansas City area, around 140,000 low-income tenants are caught in that storm. They can't afford their housing costs, and there's nowhere cheaper for them to move to. We'll hear some more of their stories later. But 40 miles to the west of Kansas City, the city of Lawrence has decided to act. Now, everybody has to pay more for housing across the board, but some people have to give up luxuries, other people have to give up necessities. Since mid-2015, the city of Lawrence has had an affordable housing advisory board. It's chaired by Pastor Matthew Studvent. If you give money, we can give food, meet some of those immediate needs, but we also have to fix systems that have created the need in the first place. The politicians, including the mayor, have got on board. So the city staff heard what we were saying and recommended that we identify a, an increment of a sales tax to be put on the ballot to let the citizens decide whether or not this was a goal for the community. In the fall of 2017, Lawrence voters said yes to the sales tax, and the advisory board will shepherd a million dollars more a year to incentivize the development of affordable housing before too long, in the next few months actually, we'll be receiving the results of a study that will help us understand what do we need to build most, what do we need to build first. This is a significant tool, but it's not the solution. We have to try many different things to address this spectrum of need. It's a regional problem, it's also a national problem. Is the problem being tackled in the Kansas City area? It has around 60,000 low-income households in need of affordable rental housing. Last year, the number of units built for them was around 60, whereas the number of more expensive units built was around 4,000. There's not a, a whole lot left. We've filtered through what we can keep and what we can't. This is what we're going to save and put in storage. I fear tomorrow that the judge would, uh, since they have a lawyer and I do not have a lawyer, will cause me and my children to be homeless. Both Nicole and Robert plan to fight the evictions by themselves in court in the hope of buying more time. Just to be able to have somewhat of an extension until I can find housing for my family. If I can't get that in 10 days, then I'm gonna be forced to move into a hotel or somewhere with my children. Nicole owes around $1,300 or two months rent. It was nearly 50% of her income. Robert had to take on a new job, and rent took 40% of what he was paid. Getting paid $8 an hour. So even at 60 hours a week, it's, it's not really enough to be able to afford that a car payment. He rented this house in Kansas City's east side for $750 a month and thought he'd found somewhere safe. Recently, not too long ago, we've had a bullet pass through our window. And it's, it's just one of those things, like, it's the way it is here in Kansas City. Having borrowed some money from a friend, he moves his family out before they're forced out. Here we are gathering the last of our things. This is my beautiful wife and daughter. That's it. 
We've managed to get this weekly place until the Sunday. Opportunities have opened up. I believe that we'll be able to go to Texas, and we're not sure if it's gonna work out yet or not, but it's for her. Her little daughter, Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Robert and his wife raise the money they need for gas by selling their plasma. Meanwhile, in East Kansas City, Nicole hasn't got the money to stay or leave. What I have been trying to do is knock on any and every door entity, whether it's churches, all the way to Smithville, all the way to Leewood, Kansas, to see if somebody would be willing to donate. She could be evicted any day now, and the stress is starting to show. I can go on and on and on to the brick of dawn around here. 11 days later, and police accompany the court's deputies who will execute the eviction. She is supposed to be coming out, and my husband's changing the locks on the house. Oh, so you're the landlord? Yeah. What's happening here today, can I ask you? Yeah, she's been evicted. She hasn't paid rent. There's other things, you know, like the water and that, but the main thing is she hasn't paid rent, and she thinks she's being targeted to have to pay rent. I was really looking for places for 500. However, with the wintertime approaching, I just took the property. My husband and I aren't heartless. We don't want to put kids out on the street, but it's also not my responsibility. I've got bills. A few months ago, Nicole's 17-year-old daughter was shot in the ankle, and Nicole took unpaid time off work to care for. They're not helping us do nothing. You want to keep on being nice to them. They're not being nice to us when our shit outside. Hold up. Nicole also has an eight-year-old son who's at school today. I like to keep my kids stable. I don't like to move around. But this will be their third move in two years. This time, they're going to stay with her sister, who lives nearby. Because of this situation and how it's been, my husband is seriously thinking about getting out of the business. We researched court records for Wyandotte County and Johnson County. Last year, together with Jackson County, there were nearly 14,000 evictions filed, and many others don't go through the courts. But isn't public housing supposed to address this? The Housing Authority in Kansas City, Missouri, is headed by Edwin Lowndes. The question I frequently get is, well, if they're not in public housing and are on the wait list, where do they live? They're living with other relatives, or they may be paying 40, 50, 60% of their income toward rent. Nicole and her children are on the waiting list for a housing voucher. I've been number 69 on the waiting list since 2016. The Housing Authority provides public housing or vouchers that contribute to the rent. Its focus is on those households earning less than $20,000 a year. At the moment, in Kansas City, it has over 12,000 families on its waiting list, which, for a one-bedroom public housing unit, could be as long as 15 years. And the federal government wants to cut more of its budget. It's very, very disappointing and frightening. I will not have the funds to run the programs that are so desperately needed. So low-income tenants are at the mercy of the private market and don't have an escape route. But some are given hope. Many of the residents are elderly, they're disabled, many of them have very serious medical conditions, and frankly, a lot of them are, are one step away from being homeless. The block is called Central Park Towers, and it's in Kansas City, Kansas. Many of its tenants qualify for rental assistance from the US Department of Housing, or HUD. This evening, some of them are meeting their lawyer, Bryce Bell. And we had heard some stories about the issues that some of the tenants were facing, such as bed bugs, rodents, mice, and cockroaches. One tenant decided she'd had enough. You're told when you're growing up, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Well, I thought it was a myth or a you know, old wise tale, but it, it wasn't, they exist. In 2014, a year after she'd moved in, Terry's nights became the stuff of nightmares. You'd feel things walking across your face, um, crawling up your back. They bite and they would itch so bad. Oh, these are scars from bed bugs. All the little spots. Terry tried to get rid of them and she notified the block's managers, the Wyandotte County Unified Government and the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation but the infestation continued. Desperate, she thought she'd call an attorney. It's outside of my typical practice area. I was looking in Google, pulled up attorneys. I'd seen him and I'm like, no, and I seen him again. And I'm like, okay, on a prayer, I said, I hope they take this and they did. Bryce took on Terry's case 
and those of about 70 other tenants who had similar complaints. I think somebody has to speak out and somebody has to do the right thing. If that's our law firm, then so be it. This evening's meeting is for Bryce to update his clients on how the case is progressing. But he's had a tip-off about a tenant upstairs who's not been able to attend. The elderly gentleman living in this apartment is struggling to look after himself. He has an infestation of bed bugs. Oscar, yeah. Right there. Oh my, oh my god. god. Yeah. That is terrible. Oh my god. All over here. Oh my god. It's almost impossible to put it into words that a human being in America goes to bed in a bed like that every night. The federal government classifies bed bugs as a public health pest, which can affect mental health and whose bites can cause allergic reactions and secondary infections. The tenant's friends have tried to help, and acting on complaints, the managers repeatedly have had pest control visit. The managers have been working with the unified government to resolve issues in the block. Terry doesn't have an infestation anymore, but she fears they're coming back. We have a bed bug that I captured. She's had to throw her bed away. The mattress is away, the frame, the headboard. I had to throw away the matching dresser. There is no way to get them out. So I sleep on the floor. Bryce visits another apartment. This one seems very clean. The tenant has done what he can, and pest control have been in and sprayed, but it still has bed bugs. Terry lived with bed bugs for around three years until her entire apartment was given heat treatment. She believes her complaints singled her out. They have threatened to evict me. I am in process of eviction right now. It's retaliation. The block's management claims she breached her lease. Bryce is defending her. She wants to leave, but her total monthly income is $750 for her disability. But if you call a lot of these places, you've got to pay the rent plus utilities. It's so hard. It's so hard. One of our major concerns when we first started investigating last year was what happens if HUD or the unified government or somebody else shuts this building down. And what we found, I believe, is there's a bit of a housing crisis. What do you mean by that? I mean, there's nowhere else for them to go. We reached out to the block's owners and the management company, but they didn't respond. What is it that's biting you? The big box. Since 2000, inspectors from the local unified government and HUD between them have visited the block 14 times. Bryce hopes to win justice for the tenants in court. One could conclude that there needs to be more regulation, there needs to be more effective enforcement, and when we don't, we get situations like Central Park Towers. Does government need to do more to protect tenants vulnerable to poor living conditions? On the other side of the state line in Missouri, the city of Independence has decided that it does. We have wonderful landlords living in our city, but you know, you always have to be looking out for those who abuse the system. Today, this rental property is being inspected and the mayor of Independence has been invited along. You know, after many years of discussion, we were finally able to implement a program. The landlords every two years have to do an inspection. The inspections came into effect in 2017. Unlike in Kansas, it's an ongoing requirement for landlords. They pay $50 per unit and choose from a list of inspectors, which includes Mike. Then we set a time, go out and do the nine items on the inspection. Although the program was billed as a public health measure, Mike is not required to inspect for black mold or pests, not that he found any here. If I see those things, I mention it to the landlord, but that is not something on our list. Why build in such a big loophole? Well, um, you know, this was developed after many conversations with landlords. There was significant pushback from landlords on a number of these issues, but it is something that as we continue to develop this program that we need to start looking at. The inspections have made hundreds of rental properties safer. This led to hundreds of landlords registering with the city. To the west, in Kansas City, Missouri, campaigners have taken encouragement. Landlords are in the public business. They rent to the public. That they say, well, this is a private business. You know, you can't tell me what to do. The campaigners have collected signatures to put a rental inspection ordinance on the ballot. It would be wider than independences and should cover black mold and pest infestations. We should insist on safe housing that's also affordable, and we can do both, and we should. Some landlords, however, 
opposed the idea of rental inspectors. To justify their job, they're going to have to find things wrong. The good landlords have to pay more money, which has to be passed on to their tenants. The landlords who do not register their properties, they can rent their houses cheaper than we can. The battle lines have been drawn. Mayor Pro Tem Scott Wagner is with the petitions. But what we're trying to do is to create a system that we can assure that everybody not only can live in a good house, but if they call the city, don't have the threat of eviction hanging over them. And that's really what we're talking about here. They'll take their petition up to the city clerk's office. The mayor pro tem has also directed the city manager to conduct a housing needs assessment, which will look into affordability issues. This was last done in 2006. Meanwhile, in the Jackson County Courthouse, Gina Chiala and a team will continue to fight for tenants facing eviction. So they have no gas, they have no heat, and the landlord has brought an illegal eviction against him. In 1950, President Harry S. Truman said, in a country such as ours, there is no reason why decent homes should not be within the reach of all. The state of America is, in my opinion, in really bad shape. I just don't think they care about us anymore. I really don't.